Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Think's webinar, my three biggest open tips mistakes and what they taught me. Uh, my name is Tim McLean. I'm the Director of Marketing here at Think. Thank you for taking some time to be with us today, along with uh, Mike Kindle, our uh, co-founder and chief architect. Mike, how are you doing today? Great, Tim. Thanks for asking. Awesome. Well, thanks. I just want a quick introduction for Mike. Um, Mike uh, leads our product development and our engineering team as our chief architect. And as I mentioned, he is Think's co-founder. So he and, and, and Aaron uh, Leon are the co-founders of Think. And uh, they both, for now, Mike, it's hard to believe it's been just over 10 years now, right? Since you guys started putting Think together and, and the whole company, right? That's right. 10 short years. <laughs> Definitely goes quick. Uh, but just a little bit about Mike before we before we get on with the content. You know, Mike. Uh, you know, he started his career while he was attending Clemson University back in 1998. Um, he had a, he co-founded a, a company there called TSoft Solutions, which was spun off into uh, or actually purchased by Clear Sky Networks uh, in 2001, um, <clears throat> and he was hired on as the network operations manager. Um, and in 2003, he built and ran a top-notch support team for U.S. networks. And really recognizing his talent at that time, Bandwidth hired Mike back in 2005 as their director of network services and sales engineering until he was approached by Aaron Leon, our other co-founder. Both of them were working at uh, Bandwidth at the time in 2009 with the idea of building our cloud-based routing system. And as we say, uh, the rest is history. So Mike, I want to say a special welcome to you. Thank you for taking some time out of your busy schedule. I know we've got a lot going on and a lot of new exciting things to talk with uh, our partners about in the coming months as we put uh, put some new projects together, including unifying our portal, which is not a surprise to anybody who's been with us a long time, but we're excited to start talking about that. And I'm really excited, Mike, to hear more about your background, obviously with open sips and some of these mistakes and uh, and what they taught you along with everybody else. Sure, great. Uh, happy to be here. Um, glad we have such a great turnout. Um, we, uh, you know, Tim approached me with the idea of doing a series of of open sips sort of webinars relative to things we've learned over the past ten years. So I kind of put together a list of things that stuck out to me uh, personally. Uh, that's what's going to be covered today. Uh, but absolutely. We'll love uh, feedback post webinar if this was applicable to you, if you found found it interesting, or if it helped you in any way, or if there are th other topics that you might like to see us cover in this space uh, for future webinars. So, as we launch into this, go, just going to cover um, three main areas. I've really got kind of four in here, and there's a lot of um, interdependency between them. So with that, I'll just jump right in. Next slide. Yeah. All right. So the first thing is external dependencies. We're talking about things that can bite you. Um, OpenSys, by and large, is a synchronous processing application. Yes, they have an async module that's useful for certain things that aren't necessarily needed in an immediate call flow setup, but really for the purpose of processing initial invites and calls. You want those packets going as quickly, quickly through those threads or the children uh, as quickly as possible to prevent things like pileups or 100% thread utilization, et cetera, et cetera. Some of the services that are external dependencies that you may be dealing with that can affect these, these children or these threads as they're, they're going through are CNAME, if you're doing caller ID name lookup, which typically you might be using a REST call for. Uh, so REST is an area. LRN, which could either be uh, an enum lookup or it could be a, a database hit on your end or it could be, there's a number of ways that you would query an external source for LRN. Any sort of database connections that you may have, whether that be for in processing, um, let's say for example, a rate lookup or if you're looking for uh, particular subscriber location, or if you've built some sort of custom feature that you're you're using internally that's connected to pick your pick your database name. It doesn't really matter if something happens with that DB. The OpenSys is going to sit there until the timeout um, and will cause a pileup. 
Same thing with uh, DNS. I alluded to that with LRN, but a lot of folks route to providers and customers using DNS. I've seen instances, and we saw one just as frequently as two Fridays ago, where Cloudflare, one of the largest DNS providers in the world, uh, had a pretty large event for around an hour that affected a bunch of a lot of the locations and services on the internet. Um, I imagine a lot of VoIP services were not immune to this. So but these are a couple of areas that if you're not thinking about, or if you've got integrated and you haven't been experienced an issue, you know, these are some areas you might want to consider looking into how you've integrated them. You know, you may never totally get away from external dependencies depending on your application design, but understanding what they are, what they're doing, and how to mitigate the impact of a potential third-party service failure is imperative. Um, some areas where OpenSIFS does a good job and have had um, integrations for a while, uh, things like with DNS, the like DNS cache module, if that's something you're not using, you should consider. Um, that will allow you the ability to locally cache lookups. It also has a built-in blacklisting feature that will prevent you from looking up known failed destinations because the last thing you want is a bunch of calls going to either a carrier DNS record or if it's say for example an origination service and you're sending it to your end customer and they've provided a DNS record for you the last thing you want is to have a failed record that you're sitting there waiting to time out on um, a lot of the timeout values within open SIFs, yeah they are tunable um, however I've discovered you know they don't they're nowhere near the pre precision that they need to have to fail quickly and gracefully. Typically you're in the, you know, minimum of like one second kind of timeout range. And that's just, if you're processing large volumes of packets, that's one second is way too long. So a couple of ways to mitigate that. I mentioned the DNS cache module that's already part of OpenSIFS and has been since at least 1.11, uh, maybe sooner. Um, they've introduced new uh, SQL caching engines in later versions um, that will allow you to cache either entire SQL tables or specific rows or results um, that will help you mitigate, you know, some of the issues around database connectivity or, for example, maintenance windows if you have to do a maintenance window. Um, one of the things that we've done, and there, there are more than, there's always more than one way to solve a problem, but the way we've solved some of these problems to make them as generic as we could, meaning if I want to operate a mixed version open sets environment, maybe maybe I'm doing a rolling upgrade. You know, maybe I'm going from 245 to testing out you know the latest 3.1 LTS, but you know there are nuances and differences between script configs because they obviously improve things and add things. So something that's available in 3.1 may not have been available in 245 or even a one dot. X branch. What we've done is create kind of a generic proxying layer in between our our, our service switches and our external um, services, so that it, it enables us to not only proxy and control our own um, rest timeouts and other types of timeouts relative to DNS, but also allows us to have a central cache repo. So I don't have to cache everything on every single system. Uh, it's handled by this proxy cluster so that could be an option for you um, especially when you're dealing with when you hit the wall of hitting a, a tunable timeout in whatever module you may be using but for example it's not a millisecond you know a millisecond level precision timeout it's a second level precision timeout which you know any kind of call volume that's gonna that's gonna um you know crash and burn um, you know, there's a saying in aviation, you know, first mission, there's a lot going on in the cockpit. You got all this glass these days and lots of information flying at you, but the first mission is fly the plane. So re before you do anything else, keep the thing in the air. Um, so what you can do when you've got these sort of external dependencies is what makes it nice for us with the proxy caching layer is if we detect a service issue with a third party service or even one of our own services that we consume internally, you can create if else logic blocks around that portion of your OpenSIPS code and then 
cash locally the detected status of that particular block. So let's say, for example, I'm doing a CNAME lookup inline. I get the initial invite. It's processing through the main route block. I've called my CNAME block. You know, uh, uh oh, you know, API endpoints down or something's going on. It's not performing. You know, your your proxy layer can detect that and just set, for example, something as simple as a memcache key value that you check one or zero. I like binary. You know, so oh, you know, CNAME is zero. You know, if zero else you know skip it and just fly right past it that way you don't waste time in your in your system creating a potential bottleneck that could create a, a pile up behind you um we've got instances where i don't even care if we make money on a call the the, the, the goal is just to get it through um we care about it over time but if it's a if it's a short-term issue or something like that or if it's an issue that's just detected we'll detect it skip the block and then in, um, in the else block, you know, raise, raise an, an event or raise a logging alert that will be picked up, say for example, by um, Prometheus or something like that. And then call to action the people that need to take a look at that particular service, but maintaining call continuity and service continuity um, for the customers. So there's a couple of points there. Next slide. All right. <clears throat> Do as much work post call setup as possible. What I mean by that, and this is one of the number one mistakes people make, they try to do too much in the call setup process. There are things that, depending on your application, can wait a few milliseconds or seconds or even longer um, that don't have to happen the second that you're trying to process that initial invite. Um, so the first part of that is cache as many of those things that you need to set up calls at locally. Cache as many of those things as you can. Uh, a couple of examples would be account information. And that could mean a lot of different things. It could be account IDs, balance information, any kind of telemetry or metadata about the account that you care about. Maybe you're stuffing stuff, stuffing things in your CERs. Maybe you're doing whatever you're doing with it. Cache as much of that as that as you can, and only cache the things that are relevant to the call flow. You know, let's say for example, you're working with an account document, and let's say it's a JSON document. Well, the account document may have you know, some things relevant to the call call flow, but the chances are it's also got a bunch of other junk in there that you don't need, like billing address or zip code or whatever. These are things that may be used later by other systems for that account document. But you don't need to really ingest and cache those because the switch doesn't really need them. So using your memory efficiently, it allows you to cache more things. You know, account information, LERG data for sure, if you're determining jurisdiction, um, LRN data to the extent that that's possible, then, you know, at least keep a hot cache of active LRNs. Um, known route sets, if you've already pre-calculated a route set for a given destination for a customer, there's no reason. And let's say, for example, you're using some form of SQL, Postgres, whatever you're using to, to figure that out. There's no reason that you have to continually recalculate that um, unless something changes. So, ca you know, cache as many route sets as you can. Um, same thing for blocked routes. We have a route blocking capability in our product that allows customers to, once they detect an issue, go ahead and put a block in for either, you know, a LAT OCN, rate center state. There's a very, uh, an MPA, NXX, whatever. Um, if you're doing something similar, cache those as well. There's no reason to hit the DB every time you have to do that. Um, if you're blocking bad annies, you know, annies that don't generate any revenue or known, or you flag them, or they come back with from some sort of reputation engine that says this is 100% bad, like this is a known bad annie, like cache that stuff and do those things before you get into the real nitty gritty and the heavy lifting or the, what I would call the slowest part of your script. Um, so, you know, the, the, the theme here is cash, 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 cash. <laughs> um, and some of the things that can help you figure out where, and I highly recommend this, where you can figure out where the slowest parts of your script are, using, are is using a benchmark module and then having an external service um, like 
Prometheus or Zabbix or whatever you may be collecting with, you know, um, pull that data periodically so you can put it into your management dashboards and visualize how that portion of your script performs throughout your day. Um, we all have, you know, high period, high utilization periods and low utilization periods. Understanding how these things behave um, over the course of your day, your 24 hour clock is important. You know, one of the things we noticed was like, like, wow, why is the latency super high? Like in the middle of the night, what's going on with this? You know, we're digging around. It's like, well, okay, the cache is cold. <laughs> Nobody's making calls. So whenever a call comes in, oh, checks cache, cache isn't there, it's gotta go to the source. So those are things that you can look at to help tune that. You may want to have an auto cacher. You know, you, you build a, a script that just precedes your your cache for you. We do that in many cases with things like CPS, et cetera. We set it somewhere centrally and then um, an application uh, run, that's running all the time just says, okay, I see something new. And then it distributes it to all the uh, various cache repos. Um, we use memcached very heavily, heavily. Some people like Redis. There's a lot of documentation and reference to Redis in the OpenSIPS uh, um, doc module documentation. These are just two examples. Um, there are plenty more, but uh, Memcache is pretty reliable um, and we use that a lot. All right, next slide. All right, the next one. Have a backup data pipeline, or as many as you think you need, depending on how vital these pipelines are to your business. Um, processing calls reliably Reliability is great and it keeps the customers happy because you know things are humming right along. But how do you get paid? How do you keep the lights on? You know, what happens if something happens and you've disconnected and you're missing CDRs or some system locks or you've got a you know a trigger or something configured incorrectly that's causing you know records to skip off the surface? Um, you know, how do you close the books accurately at the end of the month? As tech people, and I don't know the, the mix of people we have on this call, but I'm a tech person and I can't tell you in the first early years of, of the business, how many hours I spent at the end of the month running manual reports and looking at what finance gave me in terms of their spreadsheets and what they said the billings should be versus what the actual billings were and trying to trace these things down when you're dealing with billions and billions of records. It was like pulling my fingernails out. Um, There's literally almost anything I'd rather be doing than you know, trying to find, you know, some piece of data in a massive mountain of data. Um, things like audit, auditing vendor bills at the end of the month. Um, I'm, I'm betting most people, you know, take a look at that to make sure you're being billed correctly. Uh, and then also on the other side of that token, I mean, depending on the service you're providing, your customer could come to you and say, hey, I don't understand this. My records say this, your records say that, prove it. Um, you know, these are things like, uh, rating calls, inserting CDRs, calculating balances, detecting fraud. These are all uh, things that can go into your data pipeline that you can, um, you should have at least two copies of. And the reason is, you know, from a finance perspective and accounting perspective, accountants always like to prove numbers from two different, from two different points. So point A shows that Okay, I can get to it there. The number matches point B. Okay, I consider that number good. Um, and that's just a minimum. Um, but this also goes back into the previous slide that I was talking about. Do as many things post call, or what I say, when I say post call, what I mean by that is post the processing of the initial invite as you can. I go back to things like rating the call, inserting the CDR into the DB, calculating the total cost or total retail, whatever you may be doing. Um, you may be doing this in call setup. Um, these are things that you should definitely not do. Move those to a post pr uh, invite process. Um, and, you know, have, have a way to have these, uh, this information distributed to multiple sources. So, you know, the answer to solving this question isn't Brent Spiner, <laughs> it's data. Data is the key to, to solving these questions. On the next slide, I'll show you an example of how you might go about doing this. One of the things I love um, about OpenSIFS, my one of my favorite modules is the RabbitMQ module. Um, it's reliable. It disconnects gracefully. It won't lock your threads up like, you know, if MySQL or somebody locks up or something. You're just you're just kind of stuck. Um, 
you know, Rabbit, you can do things like run shovel locally and, you know, kick it up to, to a centralized queue or centralized queues, or cluster queues later. But you can do a lot of things with this process. So the, the ACC module already has an integration with the event module. So it'll throw an event for you as long as you define the mod params when you're setting it, setting it up for events. And you can put whatever AVPs that you're collecting in there and it'll, it'll put it into, I recommend doing a fan out queue. Um, the reason is I can publish one message. I can have however many queues I want with however many consumers connected to those for redundancy purposes. Um, and then we do a lot of things post post initial invites. So I take that, that uh, event out of the queue and let's say I have three consumers running on three different queues. You know, one of them is most likely going to be the master and then it'll have a bunch of subordinates uh, that are waiting in case the main or the primary and the master fails, you know, the, the subordinates will sort of wake up and do the work. Um, they're always doing the work, uh, but typically if they're in subordinate mode, uh, it just sort of processes the message and throws it into the bit bucket. But if it's like, oh, it's my turn to do something, then it wakes up and says, okay, I'm actually performing the work now, not just going through the motions. Um, but you may want to have two primaries and primary A would say go to data store A and, pr and primary for queue B would go to data store B. Now you have two different data stores holding, yes, it's a duplication of data, but again, we're looking for precision here, especially when it comes to money. Um, and you don't have to keep these things in your secondary store forever. That can be a backup store that you maybe rotate partitions out of if it's a SQL type database or that you set uh, TTLs on if you're using any kind of key value store. Um, but the point is you want to keep that data around long enough to where you can cure any potential gaps in your CDR coverage. It's like you come into work the next day and you get a report and it says, wait a second, you know, we only build half of what we normally build. Why was that? Oh no. One of our switches decided, decided it didn't want to report these CDRs or whatever. This is just an example. Um, you can actually go to, your data source B and the data would be there and say, okay, we can pull part of the data from A and fill in the gaps from B um, as an example. Um, another way to do this without the complexities of what I just described with Rabbit is yes, if you wanna keep your direct SQL or MySQL hookup, you can do that. So just running the regular ACC insert, but I would also recommend adding at least even if you don't do the fan out, just one direct queue where you throw these events into and have some sort of consumer written in the language of your choice, doing the post-processing, adding things together, manipulating the data, basically doing your data transformation before it, it deposits it in its final resting place. So those are the main, the main things that I thought that I've run into that were sort of interesting problems that definitely caused some pain points and that we had to solve and I've sort of illustrated how we've gone about solving some of those things. Um, and I'm hoping that this resonates with you, with, with some of you, if any of you have had similar experiences, we'd love to hear from you. Um, if this helped you, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, also, if there are other things that you'd like to see us cover or talk about in the future, we're happy to put these together. Um, you know, doing this for a long time, it's sort of easy just to pull things out of memory and, and put together a, a discussion board for this. So uh, something I like to do, I always love to hear other people's experiences of like, oh man, that happened to me too. And we solved it a different way or, oh man, I'm still dealing with that. Or you know, a lot of people that haven't dealt with these things kind of panicking a little bit saying, uh oh, am I at risk? <laughs> so love having those discussions. And Great. I think right now we've got some time for questions. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say uh, just a quick reminder. Thank you, Mike, for for that great content. Um, please use the the Q and A box. Uh, we actually do have a question here, which I'll give to you in just a second, Mike. Uh, which is great. Love to see some more. Um, <clears throat> just keep in mind, too, guys. We we did record today's session, so you will be getting an email from me uh, probably by the end of the day. And uh, feel free to reply to that email and with with your ideas, right? If there's something else you'd like Mike to talk about, you know, from the Open Sips environment reply to that, um, you know, just get back in touch with us. We're always looking for those great ideas. And uh, like I said, you'll get a recording of this. We're also gonna be posting it to our blog. So you'll be seeing us and, and hearing from us as well. 
So Mike, the first question we got here was, what, what was the decision that kind of went into picking OpenSIPs kind of as the basis for, uh, for the platform? As opposed to Camellia or, or exactly. any other platform, I'm assuming. That's uh, right. I was, was afraid. I didn't, it, I didn't know how to pronounce it. Right? That's all. It, Sorry. Was it, was, it, it, it was familiarity and relationship-based. So when I was at Bandwidth, we were using something called OpenSIR. And it was like 1.2 or 1.3, I think. By the time I left, it was 1.5. Um, and then, you know, they split into two camps. And I already had a relationship with Bogdan and most of his team. And it was really just a personal preference from a relationship perspective um, at, at, that, at that point. You know, if I was coming into it cold turkey, would I have made a different decision? Maybe. But that's just the reason we chose that. Gotcha. Thanks for that question, Mark. Uh, we have another question here. Uh, actually, I think it's more of a comment from Jason. Maybe you can expound on it. He said, uh, love all your points about caching and waiting to process stuff that doesn't have to be done in real time. Uh, anything else you wanted to, to add to that? From, I'm not sure I understand from which perspective. You, from the caching end of things? Yeah, I guess so. I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add in there. <laughs> Just about the importance of you know leaving things that uh, should be done in real time. Make sure those are done in real time, but uh, you know the importance of putting things off uh, after the fact. Yeah, and what I mean by that is you know, the, is it mission critical for you to have an exact cost on a call at that second for the total? You know, or say for example when um, the ACC module decides to fire fire uh, an insert, let's say in a MySQL, that happens when the call ends. Um, you know, what happens if you've got a trigger or something that you're using, or maybe even a roll up store procedure or something that's that's hosed and it prevents that from going in. Um, I, we've had similar issues like that in previous designs. And this is just something that we, we engineered around for those reasons. Um, it was like, look, we don't want to wait and we don't want a third party dependency for this particular operation. Let's just throw it into this big bucket and move on. Right. Makes sense. Um, somebody's yeah. asking, which, which I'm, I'm glad this came up. I know we, you and I have been talk, we've talked about this before. Is, you know, we, we see stir shaken, things going mm -hmm. on around stir shaken. You know, have we implemented this? And uh, what's our initial impressions on this when it comes to how that will interact with OpenSIP? Yeah, so. LTS 3.1 just came out, um, you know, <laughs> I laugh because LTS is, a, I, I view as a, a malleable designation, especially when you're dealing with open source software, just because they say it's LTS doesn't, you know, doesn't mean it's ready. Um, it's one of the, the features that they've got within there. We're actively developing against this. Um, and we're looking at a lot of different options here. Um, you know, I've got my own personal opinions about how this is going to roll out and I'm, I'm saying roll out like with air quotes because you know, I think there's going to be some hiccups with it for a variety of reasons um, but you know June 30 2021 it's coming and I personally think that we may see something similar to what we did with the Verizon SMS surcharges where they set the date in the sand and then somebody with a lot more clout than us comes up and says, hey, we missed something, and then they punt it. Um, not banking on that, but I'm guessing, you know, with being in the telecom industry, as long as I have, you know, <laughs> if it gets delivered on time, I'll be very surprised. But uh, nevertheless, we're, we're operating under the auspices that it's gonna happen, and we're developing against it for our own internal solution. We're also evaluating, uh, some of the larger providers and what they're doing and kind of making that build by decision because at the end of the day, if it's, you need to be compliant by X, you know, and we're still mid development, I need to have a backup plan. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, <clears throat> Dan asks, um, what are your thoughts, Mike, on data consistency across data centers? You know, things like subscriber data availability outside of a cache. Yeah. And that, that's a unique problem that's not unique to us. I mean, let me say that in a different way. Um, if you're dealing with registrations or you're, you're handling that in, in any kind of way for your authentication, I can see, I can understand that question. We don't actually do or support registration. I'm not tracking 
individual subscriber location data for the purpose of like say for example tracking where their handset is or if they've got like you know three of them and you're trying to locate them all that kind of thing um, data consistency across data centers has always been a challenge even with even across cloud uh, it really depends on the data database technology that you're using um, you know we found we've tried a variety of things from Galera clusters to traditional MySQL master slave setups to migrating to MariaDB and doing a similar setup to integrating other databases that have integrated data distribution like Couchbase. Um, it's kind of idiot proof. You just point it at another cluster and hit XDCR and, and go. That works if you're using JSON documents. Um, but data consistency um, has always been an issue. Um, one of the things we do for large volumes of data, large volumes of data we store locally in the same data center. We replicate it later, off hours. Uh, it, it's actually constantly happening. And that's, that's for DR purposes, but really what you want are the macro level data of what you're looking for. So we all know that the, the highest volume of data we generate are, is from the ACC module. And sadly, most of that are what they call missed calls, which stinks because we still have to do all the work, but we don't get paid for those calls because they didn't connect. Um, and it, and it, it piles up. So that, I'd call that like a tier two data uh, source because you really don't need it for anything other than troubleshooting. You're not billing it. You're not doing any of those things. But on your completed calls, you've got a lot of macro level data you care about. Like, do you care about the individual cost of a call? Sure you do per call, but when it comes to build time, do you care? No, you care about how many intrastate calls do I have? How many interstates, how many internationals? Um, and what we do is create aggregate level um, billing data records that are much smaller, but have periodic time periods, like say for example, 15 minute periods or even hourly or daily periods um, that we can easily ship around um, because that's the data we're gonna use for billing um, and, and other functions like credit detection, and those types of things. Gotcha, got another good one here. Uh, Galera cr uh, clusters, um, how did that work out for you in the past when We've used these, he said, uh, it locked out cluster members to maintain data consistency, which turned out to be not great. Uh, I'm more concerned about the data being available now and eventually, an eventual consistency later. Eventually, since, yeah. Yeah, since calls have to go through now rather than wait until a cluster member is resynced. Yeah, yeah, Galera was introduced very early on um, and you know ran into those same issues, kicking members out, data consistency across cluster members. Um, we actually, ended up migrating everything away from that to uh, more of a, a fan out master slave. So one, you know, read, write master and then read onlys. Anything that we do that just is just a read only, we talk to, right, you know, using like a proxy SQL or HA proxy, whatever you're using, you know, just fanning those across N plus however many you want for reads and then electing write masters at different locations in the network um, is has worked a lot better. Gotcha. Well, Mike, looks like we're just a tiny bit over time, but appreciate all the great questions from everybody who attended today. And uh, like we said, we'll, we'll reach out with a recording of today's session and give you a chance to reply and, and uh, give us your feedback on other topics you'd like us and Mike to cover from the open tips uh, environment. And I think somebody somebody might want to snuck one last one in. Let's see. Let's sneak one in. Uh, master master GTID replication can be used between multiple masters. Wouldn't this have been a better choice than proxy SQL? I think it really depends on the application, what you're trying to do in some of the subordinate systems. Um, like I said, there's always more than one way to get to uh, solving a problem. I'm fortunate enough to work with uh, a team of really talented engineers, um, our core team that handles everything from, um, you know, DevOps roles through working with architecture with me, et cetera. So we tend to collaborate on these things and, you know, usually one, one solution will percolate to the top just based on our collaboration.
collaboration across all of, all of the considerations we have to make, not just as it relates to open SIPs, but the other pieces of the application that these things support. Um, so that's one of the reasons we chose that. Gotcha, makes sense. Well, Mike and, and everybody, thanks again uh, for your time and for joining us today. And uh, look for that email and, uh, you know, lots more open SIPs content coming from, from Mike and the Think team. And I uh, want to say, again, thanks for everybody taking, taking the time today. And uh, Mike, you in particular, much appreciated. And with that, we'll go ahead and sign off. And uh, like I said, watch your inbox and we'll be uh, talking to you real soon. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone.